Welcome to the University of Michigan Dentistry Podcast Series, promoting oral health care worldwide. especially these multiple center protocols are really getting to be a problem. I don't know if we should try to develop some sort of checklist or something like that, but you know, the third time in, it seems like you know we would not have to go through so much. Let's just take a look at this one one more time and see, can we get it straightened out? Sure, it's a multi-center protocol. You've seen it before. We uh, didn't get enough information on the human subjects part of the protocol itself, and the consent form has some difficulties mm -hmm. too. Mm -hmm. Was it the language difficulty primarily? Or? There's a lot of scientific terms in mm -hmm. it, and um, I believe the committee wouldn't uh, agree that there was enough description mm -hmm. of the type and amount of blood that's going to be drawn. Okay. Does it give them an idea of how, how many visits they have to make? You know, I think he's yeah. weak in that area, okay. too. All right. Okay. Now, what do you think we ought to do? Have you talked to him? I've talked with him several yeah. times. Uh -huh. He's enthusiastic. He's a young investigator. It's the first time he's... Uh, tried to go through the committee. I uh -huh. think right now he doesn't understand what they want and he's getting angry. Okay, so he's at the hostile level now, so. Almost. Almost. Nice okay. guy. All I mean, right. he's approachable. Okay. So but you think I should call him or? I, I think that would okay. be wise. All right. Okay. Let's look at this behavioral one that's a problem. Okay. This investigator wants to do this videotape, but I'm really concerned about, you know, whether the people know that he might use it for teaching purposes. I don't want him to be tempted to do that. I think it's going to be difficult to explain that to this fellow. He's already upset because he feels that the IRB is interfering with his work. He wants to go ahead. And is he afraid if he tells them that he won't be able to get people to participate? Or? I think he's afraid of that. I don't think he wants the consent form to be any longer than it mm -hmm. is. Okay. Right. I also think... I'm Edmund Pellegrino, director of the Kennedy Institute for Ethics at Georgetown University and professor of medicine. The comments you just heard reflect some of the common confusions and misunderstandings about the functions of an IRB and the criteria an IRB uses to evaluate a protocol. These comments are typical of the views of the scientific community, of the people who direct research, and even the general public. The IRB is carrying out an important moral and social responsibility. Scientific research involving human volunteers is permitted by society to advance medical knowledge for the benefit of all. But if we are to continue to have that privilege, investigators must always stress the safety of the volunteer and the evaluation of the benefits gained. The process of review, therefore, is designed first to protect the subject, second to provide guidance to the design and experiment that will produce the results being sought. The IRB process also assures society that those who are knowledgeable but not immediately involved will independently review the experiment, give it approval, and provide assurances that society's moral mandate will be fulfilled. What we will be seeing today is the review of a specific protocol designed to investigate the effects of strenuous exercise on blood clotting. The subjects will be normal volunteers. They will be subjected to a series of examinations involving the drawing of blood, underwater weighing, exercise on a treadmill, monitoring of cardiovascular and respiratory function. The benefits to the volunteers will be minimal. By and large, the significance of the experiment lies in the information it will provide for our understanding of normal exercise and its effect on blood clotting and heart disease. Let's look now at the criteria the IRB will be using to evaluate this protocol. We want to examine the criteria themselves, the way they actually work, and what their purposes are. First, the risks to the subject must be reasonable in relationship to the benefits to the subject and the importance of the knowledge to be obtained by the research. The risks themselves must be kept to the minimum possible to achieve the purposes of the research. There must be an equitable selection of subjects. Informed consent must be obtained and documented to safeguard the right of the subject to accept or refuse participation in the study. The privacy and confidentiality of the subject must be safeguarded. 
There must be a continuous monitoring of the data. In January 1981, the Food and Drug Administration and the Department of Health and Human Services issued the regulations that now govern the performance of research involving human volunteers, the aim of the regulation being to protect those volunteers in the process of the clinical investigations. For the next few moments, let's look at these criteria in a little more detail. First, we must look at the protocol. It must be scientifically sound. It must be properly designed so that the knowledge being sought will in fact be obtained. And the methods will yield the knowledge that is sought. And the knowledge itself must have an importance for understanding human health or human behavior. We must always remember we are exposing human subjects to a certain number of risks. We have to have some kind of a moral sanction to do that. If we were to start out with a protocol, for example, that had certain scientific weaknesses, one that wasn't properly designed, then we'd be unnecessarily exposing people to risks. The Institutional Review Board has a responsibility to assure itself that, in fact, the criteria of scientific probity have been fulfilled. It need evidence of that fact. That in itself is also a moral requirement. We have to look at the whole protocol from the subject's point of view as well. If you were a subject, you would want to know if the information to be gained would be worthwhile for yourself or for some other person. The subject cannot give valid consent unless he feels the risks are worth running. So whether it's biomedical research or behavioral research, the first criterion is exactly the same. Important scientific knowledge must be obtained, and the generally accepted canons of good scientific research must be fulfilled. Now the second criterion, what are the risks? We have to admit that in every experiment involving humans, clinical or behavioral, there is some risk of pain, discomfort, or even harm to the volunteer. Every effort must be made to minimize risk. Even though we had a very significant possibility of helping someone, we would have to assure ourselves in the IRB that the investigator had taken every possible precaution to reduce those risks to the minimum necessary to fulfill the purpose of the research. Has the research, for example, incorporated safeguards to protect against the risks? Insofar as possible, does the researcher intend to use procedures already indicated for the individual subject's condition? Selection of subjects is very important to avoid discrimination or overselection of vulnerable subjects. Here, the IRB should be interested in who is selected and from what populations. Are particularly susceptible populations being chosen? Prisoners, for example, students, older people, sick people, children, people with malignant diseases, psychotic or emotionally disturbed persons, people for whom there are language problems. People who are particularly vulnerable must receive special protection. Informed consent is the central ethical issue in experimentation. Under no circumstances may we involve a human being in experimentation without his consent. What do we mean by informed consent? Informed consent means that the subject has to have a full disclosure of procedures, risks, and benefits. What is going to be done? For what reasons? What risks are there? What are the dangers? The kind and the possibility of discomfort? The loss of time? perhaps even the loss of dignity. The benefits, the alternatives, all those circumstances that go along with being a research subject must also be made clear to the subject. The investigator has the responsibility to ensure himself that the person does in fact understand. That means that we have to be dealing with competent individuals or their legally authorized representatives. Persons who can perceive and process the information, can make a decision which is their own on the basis of their own values and express their decision 
clearly to us. The decision must be free of coercion. The individual truly must volunteer. Throughout the entire experiment, subjects must know they have the right to discontinue, to withdraw from the experiment at any time they wish to do so. Once involved, subjects are sometimes afraid to withdraw. The experiment has a certain momentum of its own. Subjects must be told that not only do they have a right to refuse to participate, but that they can withdraw at any time. And they must be able to withdraw without being penalized for any agreed upon fee or associated treatment. Society gives us a mandate to involve humans because it's the only way we can find out about the effects of new drugs, new treatments, or new psychiatric maneuvers of various kinds. Those new procedures had to be tried out in some human being, somewhere, sometime, before we can involve someone as the subject of an investigation. We must be sure to respect their rights as a person. Under all circumstances, privacy and confidentiality must be stringently safeguarded. This means that the IRB must assure itself, both from the protocol and from the questioning of the investigators, that any information detected about the volunteers will be kept confidential and limited to those who are authorized to know. And the subject must be told who it is that has access to this information. That information might be damaging, for example, to the person's reputation, to his social status, or even to his job. The information itself might create anxiety for the subject. The subject privacy and capacity to control his way of life must not in any way be compromised. Throughout the entire experiment, the data must be monitored by the investigators or preferably by some other group. In the course of the experiment, it may become apparent that the treatment is so beneficial that to continue to have controls would be doing a disservice to the controls. Or the other way around, it may become evident that the drug is very toxic or ineffective then it ought to be withdrawn before the study is finished. In the case of behavioral research, emotional trauma to subjects may be such that the information, even though significant, is not worth getting. This means that there must be continual feedback. Every one of the criteria must be monitored in the light of how the experiment is actually going. Approval for an IRB is not unconditional. These are the six criteria that form the basis upon which an IRB conducts its review. Now let's turn to an actual experiment. We'll follow it from the time the investigators are preparing for IRB review through to the actual conduct of the experiment. Anemic. And then if you take too much blood, it might affect the performance of the athlete. Now let's look at the way the research team well, prepares well in advance for the IRB We're presentation. Not an anemic woman. I think that's pretty clearly outlined, but I mean, this raises a bigger issue altogether about the consent form. I, I based uh, the consent form upon, you know, on previous runs we've had, and uh, I mean, is it readable? Is it is it is it understandable for the average subject who's coming well, I, in here? I don't think that the average subject is going to know what 50 mLs is, so well, I think if you could put it in terms <laughs> of teaspoons, tablespoons something like that, then certainly a woman is going to be able to okay. understand how much it is. Here's another critical point raised by one of the members of the research team. Other terms understandable to the subject. Great care must be taken to provide the information in terms of the educational background, the language, and the culture of the volunteer. This may be crucial when patients are the volunteering subjects. They are particularly prone to confuse treatment and experiment. Now let's look at this same protocol as it is presented to the IRB of the hospital sponsoring the research. Again, you'll see that the criteria serve to focus a thorough discussion. Sue, I wonder if you could start by giving us uh, a breakdown on this proposal. Okay, uh, in this protocol, we're looking at how the fibrinolytic system, that is clot formation and clot dissolving, responds to acute exercise 
and whether this response differs in people of different conditioning levels. Specifically, we're going to be looking at uh, women, and we're going to be looking at highly trained women, moderately trained women, and then a group of untrained women. We hope to do about 80 women in all, uh, half on birth control pills and half not on, on the pill, since the pill's known to affect the, the clot formation system. Uh, essentially, what we'll be asking the women to do is come in and take a maximal exercise stress test. And we're going to be taking blood before and after this exercise bout. And we'll also be monitoring several other factors, uh, oxygen consumption, temperature monitoring, and we'll have an EKG hooked up so that the people will be monitored continually while they're up there. This uh, stress test will be under the supervision of a physician. A physician will be in the, in the room conducting the test and the physician draws the blood. Um, and then in addition, after that test is over, we will be weighing the subject under water to determine her percent body fat. These are the kinds of details that the IRB should ask for, because it must make some judgment about whether the investigator's claims to protect the safety of the subject are in fact true. Reviewing what was written in the protocol is necessary to bring out possible contradictions. Nothing should be left to chance. We generally recruit subjects by posting announcements, say, within the university, or using in-house papers, or in-house papers at local, other local universities, whatnot. Occasionally, we've had an article in the newspaper soliciting subjects. Sue, in, in using uh, humans in experimentations, it's very important that we completely be aware of, of the benefit, the, not just the quality of the science, but whether or not it's worth, the, the purpose of the experiment is worth the risk to the individual. In this e experiment, what exactly is the significance of the results you hope to obtain? How important is clotting factors in people exposed to uh, stress? Is it really that clinically significant, health significant? At this point, the IRB member is testing two things. First, whether or not the design of this experiment is sufficiently rigorous and the information sufficiently significant to warrant doing the experiment in the first place. That is to say, to justify putting these subjects under the discomfort of a stress test. The second thing is to determine whether or not there is some benefit to the subjects from the information to be gained. One of the underlying theories of, or one of the current theories of how uh, atherosclerosis develops involves clotting, the laying down of small clots in the arteries. And I think the feeling is that if exercise changes this clotting system, it may help to prevent in the laying down of those clots or maybe even help dissolving clots that have already been laid down. Well, you, you said exercise in women. How much exercise do you, are they going to take? I mean, what are these highly conditioned women going to do? Okay, the highly conditioned, well, first of all, let me say that the stress test is what's called volitional max, which means the subject herself determines when the test stops. We ask the woman to go as long as she possibly can because we are looking for a max test. We want an indication of her maximum capacity for exercise. But on the other hand, she's the one who determines when that point comes, assuming we don't see any reason to stop the test. Uh, so that it is volitional. When are the participants informed that they can stop the test? Two very important points are being explored here. The first is the assurance the subject can at any time ask for discontinuance of the test, whether because of discomfort or simply because of anxiety. And the second point is to examine whether or not the elements of informed consent have indeed been provided for. Even before the subject agreed to participate, she should know that she can withdraw at any time. How does the investigator respond? Actually, um, she's told at least twice. The first time is in when I have an initial sort of interview with her, usually over the phone, and I'm explaining the entire uh, protocol procedure to her. I will tell her in that that she may stop at any time. And she's, she's essentially the one that determines when the max point occurs. Uh, and then she will be reminded of that again before she gets on the treadmill. Where is the test being conducted? in our lab in, in the, the university here so not in the hospital that's right what kind of equipment is available in the lab in case of an immediate emergency such as when you're drawing blood or during the stress test here we have another repetition of the criterion of safety 
to determine what measures are available in case of a mishap. Are there safeguards and are they sufficient to minimize the risk to the subject? We have a crash cart which includes a defibrillator and emergency drugs and the physician is present supervising the test and then everyone in the lab has been trained in CPR so we're all capable of doing uh, emergency resuscitation. How much blood is going to be drawn and how often is it going to be drawn? We have the subject seated in a blood drawing chair essentially prior to the mm -hmm. test mm -hmm. and that's where the initial uh, pre-exercise sample is drawn and then after she runs she's sat back down again in that chair how and much, we draw another How much blood will be drawn at each sitting? Each draw is uh, 50 cc's so that the total is around 150 which is about a quarter of what you would give if you were to give a blood donation. Somehow the way you just said that uh, it came through to me as more blood being taken than I was aware of when I read the study and, and I, I identify from that with if I were a subject uh, uh, I think it possible that I might have missed it too. I uh, generally tell the women uh, when I'm explaining to them, I say almost exactly what I just said then, that it's about a quarter of the amount, the total amount is about a quarter of what you would give if you went to give a blood donation. So that it's... Okay, I wonder from that though if it shouldn't be as opposed to being dependent on, you. Know, I mean you could, you know, get sick or something, someone else take over and then it's not there. Uh, I wonder if it shouldn't be in the consent form in that sort of clarity. Well, I second your thought, Randy, because I just saw it as three little blops about that mm -hmm. thing. Yes, yes. Uh -huh. Three times. At this point, the IRB member is pursuing the question of a proper consent form and assuring himself on the board that it has been properly executed. But over and above that, the IRB member is making a contribution to the way the consent should be obtained. The IRB review process is not simply a judicial one or a legal one. It also provides actual participation in improving the protocol. So as you can see, the IRB can be a help to the investigator as well as to the subject. Who's responsible for withdrawing the blood from the participants? In our lab, it's usually actually the physician who does the blood drawing. Sue, there was a lot of concern here about women and the stress tests. There were uh, some male studies, I noticed also, and uh, was there anything adverse that came up in those studies that would help us here? I think there was, uh, well, let me first say I was not here at the time that study was done, but I think there was one incident where a person collapsed after having run on the treadmill during that study. And I believe that he was able, he was resuscitated in the lab and that we didn't have to call in any emergency equipment. So that's kind of encouraging in that it, it indicates to me that we have the capability to handle that kind of emergency in the lab. At this point, we can see how important careful and consistent probing of the protocol can be. The response in this case indicates that one patient actually had collapsed while on the treadmill test. If one listens to the language of the investigator, we even hear the word resuscitated. Up to this point, the full extent of the danger to the subject had not yet been elaborated. The investigator is conscientious, but the IRB process has served to uncover important information of significance to the subject. So I was wondering if you could tell me, I know some of the women are going to be taking oral contraceptives, but are you checking as to whether they're taking any other medication? Uh, we specifically ask and check to be sure uh, we eliminate everybody who's on anything other than oral contraceptives, and that includes even aspirin, uh, well, particularly aspirin because of its effects on the clotting system. So we do check for that, and we do eliminate subjects on any kind of medication. Um. Could you tell me just what is being done to protect the confidentiality of uh, the participants in this? Suppose, for example, um, the uh, testing comes up with some information uh, that uh, the volunteer would rather not have known. What kind of protection is built into the system? Here we have an exploration of still another criterion, the protection of the privacy of the subject and the confidentiality of the information obtained during the investigation. Information can be damaging to the patient if it is revealed 
when it should not be, or if it is withheld when the subject should know about some unsuspected disorder. The only people who have access to an individual's files are our lab group and the individual herself. I mean, we, don't, we would not release that information without her consent. Are the files coded, or do they have people's names on them? In the past, they've had people's names on them. However, recently, we've started coding so that they are assigned numbers now, so that a person couldn't just walk in, rifle through the files, and find the one they were looking for. If, as a result of this uh, study, you uncover some completely uh, unexpected information, for example, say as a result of the blood count, you've, it's estimated that the patient might have leukemia. Just give an example. What do you do about that? Uh, Dr. Ferguson would inform the person of that finding and then I think recommend that they see their own physician or if they needed a recommendation of someone to go to, we could supply them with that. Uh, I think that when people volunteer, they should know what they're going to get out of the experiment. In, in this case, for the subjects who aren't runners or ex exper uh, volunteering for that reason, they're going to volunteer so that they can get cleared and say, I'm OK to go running now. And it's unclear from this whether such persons uh, uh, will have grounds for being cleared to go running or whether they won't. And I think they should know that. The question of benefit to the subject is an important one. It should be inquired into closely, as it is being done here. The subject might volunteer for an experiment simply out of a feeling of beneficence for his fellow human beings, even if he or she received no personal benefit. If that is what the person's intent in coming in to take the test would be for us to give the data to their physician and let them discuss with their physician what kind of exercise they wanted to undertake based on the results of this test. Uh, and I'd certainly hope that their physician would caution them about how reliable it is to interpret this test as meaning that it's all right for them to start exercising. I don't think anybody can give them 100% assurance on that. Sue, do you have any personal hesitancy about being a volunteer for this study? Uh, no, as a matter of fact, I was a subject in the pilot study. Okay. So I don't have any problems with the protocol. Although I realize, from my own experience in the lab, sort of the more I do as a subject, the less any of it bothers me. So I try to keep that in mind when I'm talking to people who aren't routinely subjects and protocols of any kind. Mm -hmm. but no, I wouldn't have any problem taking part in this study. Mm -hmm. There are some who would insist that the investigator always subject himself or herself to the proposed procedure in a pilot test. It is very reassuring that the investigator did just this and experienced some of the discomforts the subjects would undergo. Having seen the IRB during part of its deliberation over this protocol, we might now move on and look at how some of the concerns of the board are carried out during the actual experiment. Anda, this is the Here we have an opportunity to see the actual it's process of obtaining of informed consent. We can observe what two key doing elements, doing and what the, risks the contractual or content aspects of today. consent, okay providing the information, getting a signature. But also, the investigator is providing the subject an opportunity to ask questions. Sue, the form doesn't really go into the actual risks that would be involved. I was wondering if you could tell me a little bit more about that. OK. Uh, the risks range all the way from some relatively minor things, like maybe twisting your ankle on the treadmill, losing your balance and falling. Mm -hmm. Or we've even had uh, one woman had an allergic reaction to the electrodes on her chest. They, so they range from that kind of thing all the way up to possibility of heart attack or some underlying heart disease showing up while you're on the treadmill. The investigator is elaborating, the ones not just providing information on a yes or no basis. The interaction allows the investigator to interject into the proceeding a moral quality, an assurance that beyond the signature, there is indeed understanding. Here we see the actual conduct of the experiment. Even though consent has been obtained, the investigator reassures himself. He checks again. He wants to be sure he has provided all the information necessary to protect his subject. It's conceivable that between the time the consent was given and the experiment actually carried out, 
some change may have occurred. This process of rechecking is very important to actually carrying out the protocol. Okay, I don't think there are any problems. I think we can get started now. Uh, I need to get some baseline um, blood now at this point. Well, in terms of the amount of blood you'll be drawing, do you think that in any way would affect my performance on the treadmill or how long I could stay on? Well, uh, I have no way of knowing that one way or the other, but because the protocol is really designed to study uh, effects of exercise on blood, I must take the blood, and uh, we've pared it down. Notice how important it is that even though the subject has given consent, new questions arise. Reassurance is necessary. The need to keep the subject informed is not a one-time event. Now, the purpose of this is we want to measure your percent body fat. And uh, fat doesn't weigh anything underwater. And so the heavier you are on the scale, the less percent body fat you'll be because we're just measuring your lean body mass on this scale. So you want to be as heavy as possible, OK? And In this experiment, we're dealing with normal volunteers. It's even more important to keep informing sick patients of what is happening to them. They, after all, are more vulnerable and more dependent on the physician and less apt to bring up the kinds of questions that this normal subject raises with ease. Now, you've got a lot left in you. You're doing real well. In about 30 seconds, we're going to go up a little higher and a little faster. It's still going to be a walk for you. If you feel more comfortable jogging, go right ahead. But it should be still at a pace that you can keep up with it simply by walking. Do you feel all right? Yeah, you're doing fine. Here we are observing another criterion. Here goes. The provision for constant monitoring to ensure yeah, adequate safeguards for the volunteer. Yeah. Not only monitoring of the physiological data, but of the subject's responses. This is important so that if any difficulty should occur, the experiment could be stopped before doing any harm to the volunteer. Okay. okay. Why don't you go this? You got a little bit left in you. Hang on there. Next click. You're doing great. Next click. Go one more after that. Want to try? No? Okay. okay. Hang in there. Okay. Go that ahead. That it? Hang on the straddle if you want. Grab the tra strad and just straddle it. That's it. Great. Okay. Hang on. It's 10.6. Okay, Anda. What you want to do is step back over those blue cables, just like we did before. Back down here, here. Yeah. Okay. Great job. Good job. Yeah, good job. Hold real still now. We get another EKG. We've just seen how an IRB functions. We've looked at the way some of the criteria are actually applied by one IRB. The criteria that we've reviewed are essential. If in our democratic society, we ought to be permitted to continue to ask human beings to participate in investigative procedures, which in the long run affect all of us. If we ought to do this, then we must be particularly careful to protect the rights and the dignity of the volunteers. The purpose of the IRB and the regulations that go with it are not, thinking back to the opening of our program, a hindrance to research. They are not meant to stand in the way of good science. They are motivated by the moral obligation that an investigator imposes on himself when he undertakes to acquire knowledge from other human beings, putting them by that fact at some risk and causing them some discomfort. The ends are worthwhile. The means must be very carefully scrutinized. That's why we need to know why the information is worth having. We must know that the scientists who are doing it have put a great deal of effort into designing the experiment so that it can be useful, that we've done every attempt to minimize the risks, that we've taken every step to be sure that the subject knows exactly what's going to happen, knows the risks that he or she runs to be sure that the investigators continue monitoring their experiments. These are the minimum requirements in a humane society for the continuance of something vital to that society, the acquisition of knowledge, knowledge that can be a benefit for all of us.
You've been listening to a presentation from the University of Michigan School of Dentistry, which is dedicated to supporting open learning and open educational resources. This recording is licensed under the Creative Commons. It may be reused and redistributed for nonprofit use. Please attribute materials to the University of Michigan School of Dentistry and redistribute under this same license. For more information on how this and other University of Michigan School of Dentistry recordings may be used, visit www.dent.umich.edu license.